Frontline is made possible by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. Explosive new allegations that strike at the very heart of the president's affair with a young female a aide. Impeachment investigation President Clinton, in as well as Vernon Jordan, are under investigation by the independent counsel, Kenneth Starr, no, for possible confirm. witness tampering. I smell a rat in all this. Do you have a moment? The president is outraged. Is it true you advise Monica Lewinsky? Only months before that eventful morning in January, Paul Begala had returned from exile to an office of his own in the West Wing. I mean, I felt like I was hit with a two by four in the solar plexus. I mean, I was, my stomach was in knots. I was sick to my stomach. Well, <laughs> I don't think I want to describe what my gut was telling me to do at that point because it had more to do with vomiting than anything else. But it was, you know, you read this and you said, this is incredible. I mean, and, and it was, it was, and it was hard to believe. The news of this day is that Kenneth Starr, the independent counsel, is investigating allegations that you suborn perjury by encouraging a 24-year-old woman, former White House intern, to lie under oath in a civil deposition about her having had an affair with you. Mr. President, is that true? That is not true. That is not true. The author of the Clinton crisis playbook returned instinctively to its fundamental strategies. First, parse the answer. They had no sexual relationship with this young woman. There is not a sexual relationship. That is accurate. By now, after listening carefully to Clinton for six years, those of us in the press knew the playbook as well as the West Wing team. We, too, parsed the words and pushed his press secretary. How in the world could the president be, matter of fact, about anything he's doing today when this is blowing up around us? We'd like to have his answers. The president has always told everyone to tell the truth. Is your interpretation of that statement that, that he meant to categorically deny that he had? I'm not going to parse the statement. You've got the statement. But even Mike McCurry was worried about Bill Clinton's answers. And we kept asking lawyers and others, well, you know, where is the strong denial, you know, we need to have a very strong denial. And of course, the president, as he struggled with the story the day that it broke, went through, a, you know, a lot of contorted answers in three interviews that he gave that day, in which there were questions about which verb tense he had used because he had said that there is no relationship. And, it, it, you know, it just, we were all looking at each other saying, you know, he didn't deny it strongly enough. That same day, on a subway in New York City, the beeper of a veteran political operative began to vibrate. You know, it was the old phone number, the, the, the president's personal line, and, um, you know, that hadn't gone off for a while, and I sort of thought maybe there was a mistake. No mistake, Bill Clinton, in trouble again, was reaching out secretly to Morris and his polls. And he said, yeah, this is horrible. This is just terrible. You know, ever since I was elected president, ever since 92, I've sort of shut myself down, shut my body down, sexually, I mean. But I just, I just screwed up with this girl. I, I didn't do what they said I did, but I did do something. And I think I may have done so much that I can't prove my innocence. And Morris, who now had personal experience with public disgrace, offered to help his old client. I said Nixon was impeached because he just never told the public the truth about Watergate. And he said, uh, you, you really think that I could do this? And I said, look, I don't know. Let's poll it. Let's find out. And um, I did a poll that night. And uh, I called him back late that night. And um, I said, well, they'll forgive the uh, adultery, but they won't forgive the lying. So I was hoping that he would sort of let the public down gently. He interpreted the poll numbers as being that he had to stonewall. And he said, well, we just have to win, don't we? The stonewalling included members of his own cabinet, which met two days after the Lewinsky story broke. Unwittingly, they did Bill Clinton's bidding. I believe that the allegations are completely untrue. I'll second that. Definitely. But surely all of you understand. Wait, wait, there's two more people left. I'll second yeah, that, too. Third. I did believe the president uh, when he spoke to us January 23rd. When you went out and affirmed that, uh, did you believe him? Yes. Absolutely, or I wouldn't have gone out and affirmed it. After consulting with a trusted Hollywood producer who also believed the president, Clinton would give a far more dramatic denial. But I want to say one thing to the American people. 
I want you to listen to me. I'm going to say this again. I did not have sexual relations with that woman, Miss Lewinsky. I never told anybody to lie, not a single time, never. These allegations are false, and I need to go back to work for the American people. Thank you. Back to work, a classic line from the Clinton playbook. Indeed, the president and his staff would stick this scandal out by focusing relentlessly on the picture of Bill Clinton hard at work. Our goal was to have the president portrayed doing the job he should be doing as president. I think the fact that we did that and that the trains continued to run on time, basically, is probably what helped rescue Bill Clinton from this uh, political scandal. This gets back to the fundamental lesson of political survival that, that Bill Clinton taught me, which is if you make it about the American people's lives instead of your life, you're going to be okay. And of course, the playbook called for Hillary to perform her role. The great story here for anybody willing to find it and write about it and explain it is this vast right-wing conspiracy that has been conspiring against my husband. The vast right-wing conspiracy. As they had done so often before, the Clintons were demonizing the adversary. One of the original hired guns was called back to the fold. It started out as a $40,000 land deal that lost money and about $50 million and five years later, after nobody could find anything, we wiring up people in hotels, feeding them whiskey, trying to get them to talk and everything else. I wasn't very subtle about it. But they no. had, but they, you had their encouragement. No, I didn't. I didn't ask them. And they didn't stop you? No. But they weren't which, which going to. They stopped me. An implicit I wasn't going to be stopped. No, oh, no, sir. Don't, don't, ever, don't ever think that this was anything close to a ploy. I, I did it. I'm glad I did it. And I pointed out things to people that needed to be pointed out. Get in here. That spring and summer passed as one West Wing insider after another was paraded before the grand jury. Monica, did you have sexual relations with the president? Monica. And the young woman at the heart of the scandal became an infamous overnight celebrity. Then, just before Bill Clinton himself would face the grand jury, word from someone close to the president that he would change his story. For those of us who followed him, this was a high-level, calculated leak to prepare the public and even his family for the messy details to come. For many in the senior staff and cabinet, it was clear confirmation that Bill Clinton had been lying to them and using them all along. I was very disappointed. I was very angry. Um, it was, it was, you know, about as uh, you can imagine. Let me put yourself in that position as someone you trusted, who you believed in, who misled you, and then I, in turn, unwittingly misled the country. I took that very, very seriously. When, once you found out that the president had not told the truth, did you feel that he had used you? For of course. I mean, uh, what's surprising about that? The president felt like he had used us. Uh, there was a, you know, along with disappointment, uh, some anger. The thing that was the overwhelming sense that you blew this great opportunity to really do some extraordinary things for the country because of this. That's kind of, that's what is the overriding emotion that I think most of us felt as we went into that, that period. After Kenneth Starr and his deputies completed their grand jury interrogation of Bill Clinton, the only president ever to face such a criminal inquiry, he retreated to the solarium in the private residence of the White House. A few of the original loyalists who'd spent that awkward evening at the Ritz-Carlton in Boston during Jennifer Flowers were this time witnessing the Clintons at the very bottom. It was, you know, it was a pretty tough day. It's a pretty tough day. Was he mad? And it just seemed tired. Mm. But didn't, didn't know. What about Mrs. Clinton? Was she upset? upset? Yeah. Yeah. She was upset. So pretty I mean, you could tell that she'd been she'd been crying. Yeah, she was she was not, you know it's not too good a move. <laughs> Once again, in the midst of a personal crisis, Bill Clinton went on national television to the chagrin of his own staff. He seemed less contrite than sorry for himself. And once again, as he had done on 60 Minutes six years earlier, 
Bill Clinton admitted no more than he had to. Indeed, I did have a relationship with Ms. Lewinsky that was not appropriate. In fact, it was wrong. The very next morning, Bill Clinton also tried to make it clear he was paying a personal price for his indiscretion. These pictures of the Clintons leaving for a vacation on Martha's Vineyard spoke volumes. Bill Clinton holding on to Buddy for dear life. <laughs> this is the way I remember the picture. <laughs> You're on the helicopter. Yeah, I was there waiting to fly off on this happy family vacation. <laughs> I, I pretty firmly believe that there had not been many conversations between the Clintons as a couple on this until they were able to get away and be by themselves. The old Harry Truman line that Bill Clinton had quoted about friends and dogs took on a certain sad truth during that Martha's Vineyard vacation, but there was little time for healing. Today, I ordered our armed forces to strike at terrorist-related facilities in Afghanistan and Sudan. American missiles had leveled targets supposedly tied to Osama bin Laden in retaliation for the bombing of American embassies in Africa. Clinton had rushed back to Washington to manage the crisis, but his national security advisor knew it would be a tough sell to those of us in the press corps who might view it cynically as an attempt to change the subject. I remember the president saying, let's just do what we think is the right thing to do. Uh, we'll probably uh, get it either way. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and uh, I think the right thing to do was, was to respond, and, and we did. But I believe... The subject wouldn't stay changed for long, knowing that Kenneth Starr was about to release his potentially devastating report, Bill Clinton would launch a campaign of contrition. I agree with those who have said that in my first statement after I testified, I was not contrite enough. I don't think there is a fancy way to say that I have sinned. Later that day, those sins, cataloged in excruciatingly graphic detail, were made public in the explosively hyped Star report. Bill Clinton met privately with an old friend who would soon join his legal team. He was a man in, in, in deep uh, trouble, personally, emotionally, uh, and uh, you could you could tell it. He knew he was in trouble personally. Uh, he was in trouble not only with his family, which was, I think, first and foremost, his concern. He had trouble with his cabinet. He was in trouble with his staff. Are you considering resignation, Mr. President? Even the true believers in the West Wing feared he might be finished. I was very afraid that the whole thing could be over that there'd be a sort of delegation of congressional Democrats and, you know what I mean, moderate Republicans go down to the White House. Come to the, the White House yeah, and, and tell say, the president yeah, just, it's over. Right. And quite candidly, I was not alone in that fear. <laughs> I was talking to a close friend in the Senate, Kent Conrad, who I've known for 25 years, and I said, um, how, how are we doing up there? And he was saying that we're about two or three days away from a delegation of senior senators from the Democratic Party coming down and talking to the president about resigning. We saw Ms. Baird testimony of Aspen and the truth, the whole truth, and the love of truth, so help you God. I do. They figured the final blow might be the public release of the president's videotaped grand jury testimony. But ironically, the sight of the president of the United States being asked such humiliating questions was just the break he needed. If you touched another person on the grass, touch the genitalia. If Monica Lewinsky says that you used a cigar as a sexual aid with her in the Oval Office area, would she be lying? To Democrats in Congress and to much of the public, Starr and his deputies seemed harsh and partisan. The president's anger seemed justified. His approval ratings actually moved up. And to the surprise of official Washington, in the midterm elections that fall, Democrats picked up seats in Congress. Bill Clinton's old arch-rival, sensing a revolt in his own party, suddenly resigned. The American people sent us a message that, that would break the eardrums of anyone who was listening. At the beginning of this term, Bill Clinton had tried to assume the mantle of healer. Now he hoped moderate Republicans might hear a healing message in the election results. 
The House will be in order. Gentleman from Illinois. But Mr. the hardliners still controlled Congress. Gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Barr. Gentleman from Georgia is recognized for one minute. And they were listening to the constituents who hated Bill Clinton. Mr. Speaker and colleagues, today our votes and our consciences must be based on the rule of law. And sure enough, on a winter Saturday, six weeks later, the United States House of Representatives ensured Bill Clinton's presidency would be won for the record books. The yeas are 228, the nays are 206. Article 1 is adopted. As he and his team quietly watched the proceedings, William Jefferson Clinton became only the second president ever impeached. He was um, just subdued, I would say. Didn't say very much. Was watched it. We just kind of watched it and didn't. I think none of us said very much. We just watched the vote take place. I think his view was that they can do whatever they want. They can they can impeach me. They can they can vote in the Senate and remove me. But they're going to have to do that to get me to leave. The Senate will convene as a court of impeachment. Removal from office was never in doubt. The Republicans did not have the two-thirds majority in the Senate they needed. Mr. Conrad. Mr. Conrad, not guilty. Mr. Coverdale. Mr. Coverdale, guilty. Bill Mr. Clinton, Conrad. of course, would win the most important vote of his life. Mr. Domenici. The old playbook had worked again. Throughout the scandal, Americans had seen him doing his job. Besides, the economy was good, and by now, the thoroughbreds' flaws were well known. But there was no glory to be had in this victory. No, this time, the comeback kid had simply survived. Not to let anything slow him down. He and his shadow, Dick Morris, 